family, a wife and three kids, and, and I live in a place that I always wanted to live in, and I do things that I love to do, and it was that moment that just takes me back every time and I just kind of relive it. Friday afternoon on that hill, sheep and goats around me and the olive tree. Um, and in fact, um, a couple of years ago, I hiked across the Galilee and I made a special note to hike to Shirley's house. And Shirley is not with us anymore. But the house is still there and the yard is there. And I went and stood under the trees and the house is now lived in by somebody else. But it didn't matter. I just walked straight into the yard, as you do in Israel, and felt totally at home. And um, just a, a, a great moment, just a wonderful kind of acknowledgement that that was my journey. And that was where I needed to be. Welcome to Waking Up to Life with Rabbi Josh, a podcast built around conversations with people in the community who have found a bit of enlightenment in their lives. While the events we talk about today may not seem life-changing for you, the conversation will reveal how those moments have shaped the way my guests see the world. It's an informal conversation along with some insights from Jewish tradition, and it may just change your life as well. And if not, it's just 18 minutes with me, so l'chaim, to life. Today on our podcast, we welcome my dear friend, Danny Margolis, who is living in Israel and a tour guide that has worked with the Temple Israel community on many, many trips, teen missions, family missions, and it's a, a real pleasure to have you here on the podcast today. Hey, Danny. Hi, how are you doing? Great. I'm so happy that we have this time together. And uh, normally we're talking about Israel to teach our members and to teach our teenagers. Today, the story you're going to share is a story that's very personal about your connection to the land of Israel. So take it away. Help us understand your life-changing moment. Okay. So Rabbi Josh, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in the north of England uh, in a place which had a small Jewish community and um, certainly not as large and vibrant as Temple Israel. It was very small scale. And uh, we used to go to synagogue on a, on a Shabbat morning. Um, but then we would come home and my dad would go to work and we'd kind of do usual things. But Friday night was very special for us because there was always something Israel orientated around it. And uh, my dad had spent two years growing up in Israel when he was a late teenager and we used to visit frequently to Israel every available opportunity and it really felt like it was home from home and yet every time at the end of the vacation we had to go back to England to our to our lives and as a kid I was all I wanted to do was stay and uh, didn't really understand how to do it so my story takes me back to when I was um, about 13 years old, 13, 14 years old. And, um, well, I'd never been allowed to go to down my own city, downtown, on my own. In those days, it was kind of dangerous for Jewish kids to wander around uh, public transport. So uh, we'd been kept in our, in our little community area. And uh, there we were in Israel, and it was the first opportunity I had to go somewhere on my own. And I wanted to visit a friend of my dad's. So um, this is a little story about a woman called Shirley, who was a little bit crazy in a good kind of way. And she'd grown up in the same street as my dad in England. And she'd moved to Israel to a moshav, which is a small farming community in the Galilee. And uh, she had a few, you know, three kids, two boys and a young girl who was about my age. And they were really fun. And they had some goats in the backyard and they grew chickens for a living and they grew their own food and it was a really kind of different life than any life I'd, I'd seen before. So um, after going there with my parents when I was 13, uh, the following year I decided that it was time to go there on my own. So my dad stuck me on a bus, told the driver where he wanted me to get off and off I went. A little nervous I must admit. Um, but after about an hour and a half on the bus, the driver told me that I could get off. And so there I was on my own in the middle of Israel, um, a new experience. And I kind of remembered the way back to Shirley's house. 
and made my way up the hill and uh, within about five minutes I was part of the family and playing with the cats and in the yard and the goats and uh, you know it was really another world for me um, anyway during my teens I had gone through a, a few um, let's say difficult stages especially with my parents who decided that their eldest son was destined to be an engineer, doctor, accountant, lawyer, any of those jobs, when really all I wanted to be was a car mechanic at the time. Um, and that didn't really fit into the way that they saw me growing up. So we had a few kind of conflicts of interest there. And it was really difficult for me to express myself for them um, growing up. And in fact, it was difficult for me to talk to anyone about it except my grandfather, who was a real shining light, and Shirley, who was this person who I didn't really know, but was this open figure, this huge, warm heart of a woman. And um, she decided to help me out, I suppose. So um, there we were in her farm, and she basically gave me an opportunity to get out of my system all of those things that were really bothering me and it involved a lot of crying and feeling like the world was ending but then she was skillfully able to put me back together uh, by basically drawing out from me the things that I wanted in my life things that would make me be more me and feel more better about myself and so after a couple of days at Shirley's um, I was feeling great. I was feeling on top of the world. And it was like I just shed this, this skin of, of woe and, and distress and kind of dumped it in the yard, in the garbage. Um, and I was free. And my mind was open. Um, and it was a very incredibly uh, elating experience. And I, I, even today, I don't quite know how it happened. Anyway... Um, after a couple of days of being at Shirley's, it was Friday afternoon, and uh, Friday afternoon, the sun was setting, Shabbat was coming in, and in Israel, Shabbat is the day of the week, it's like beyond any other day, everything kind of goes into the, this relaxed mode, and whether you're religious or not, it doesn't matter, whether you go to services or not, it doesn't matter, it's just this all-engulfing atmosphere, and it was wonderful. And there I was in Shirley's yard, looking out over a beautiful mountain called Tavor Mountain. And the sun was starting to set. And I was underneath the olive trees and the, the goats were all around me. And suddenly this voice from inside me, which had kind of been locked away in a, in a, in a, in a hidden place, suddenly told me, Danny, you have to live here in Israel. You've got to be here. And I was like, yes, I have to be here. And that was it. That was the moment that I knew that the rest of my life was going to be spent in Israel. And um, I, I would have been happy to just stay there from that moment. But as I was only 14, I didn't really have the full say in things yet. But um, I came to Israel after high school and during college and basically at the first genuine opportunity, which was after, after college, I got on a plane and came to Israel, and I've been here ever since, and uh, every day is a happy day for me. Uh, I feel very fulfilled, and um, even when things are not, you know, 100%, they are certainly 99%. Uh, I now have a wonderful, wonderful family, a wife and three kids, and, and I live in a place that I always wanted to live in, and I do things that I love to do, and it was that moment that just takes me back every time and uh, I just kind of relive it Friday afternoon on that hill, sheep and goats around me and the olive tree. Um, and in fact, um, a couple of years ago, I hiked across the Galilee and I made a special note to hike to Shirley's house. And Shirley is not with us anymore, but the house is still there and the yard is there. And I went and stood under the trees and. The house is now lived in by somebody else, but it didn't matter. I just walked straight into the yard, as you do in Israel, and felt totally at home. And um, just a, a great moment, just a wonderful kind of acknowledgement that that was my journey. And that was where I needed to be.
It's amazing to hear you talk with the kind of passion. You know, I have the opportunity to listen to you all the time. As a tour guide, you share that passion for Israel, for the history of our people, for the culture of our people. But to hear you personalize it is pretty amazing. And I, and I, as I listened, I couldn't help but wonder if all of us have actually those moments and maybe we don't pay attention. I, I'm drawn to the story of Moses who sees the burning bush, but what the rabbis teach us about that is that it's not that he saw the burning bush, it's that he actually turned to pay attention to the burning bush. So we see things all the time, right? You, you were in Israel often, but somehow surely opened your eyes to, I guess, what was inside your soul. And, and I wonder if you, if you still feel that, that she sort of opened your soul to this new experience in life. Yeah, I think she she taught me how to look at things in a, in a different way. And um, one beautiful example that uh, she taught me on that on that same visit was um, she she'd had a, a, a relationship with her husband which was unsuccessful, and they she wanted to be on the farm and he wanted to live in a city, and they didn't really live in the same world. So she told him one day that he should really go. And I think he was, they were both relieved and off they went separate ways. But um, she said to me, she said to me, listen, she said, she showed me a picture on the wall of her house. I see you have some nice pictures on the wall of your, of your room by Josh as well. And I think we all have pictures in our house that we, when we hang them on the wall, they are very meaningful for us because that's why we hung them on the wall in the first place. They, they had, there was something there that drew us. But after a while, you know, those pictures are kind of there all the time and we don't necessarily look at them and, and, and sort of give them that, that moment. And she said to me that a successful relationship is like a picture on the wall. She said that if every day you look at the picture and you remember that moment when you hung it and why you chose it and why it's special to you, she said that then it'll always stay fresh. It'll always be there for you. That, that understanding, you might not be in that same place forever, but at least, the at least you won't walk on by, as it were, and, and, not, and not be in, in that moment. And I think that's really important as well. And for many things for me, including my, my family, I, I, you know, I love them so much that I can't not stop to think about them in that way that they're they're special and every day i remind i'm reminded by that like the picture on the wall and many experiences i have i think reflect that for instance as a tour guide i'll go to a place and hundreds of times and everybody says to me you know isn't this boring you came to the same place again and again and again but no it's it's never boring it's always interesting and it's always different even if it is the same place, it's it's fresh. I'm a different. It's a different day for me. It's a different person that I'm sharing it with, and those things are, are wonderful that they kind of occur and reoccur and always be exciting. I love that imagery. Uh, I'm just wondering whether or not, as you have be, become a parent, how has being a parent been implicated or aligned with that philosophy, sort of that idea. You're a very passionate person. You're a person who is a little bit of a free spirit. Have you given your children a different kind of freedom because of those experiences that you grew up with? Absolutely. Uh, without any doubt, I have given my children every um, opportunity that they desire to follow as long as it's not ridiculous uh, or dangerous to them but every everything that is in their heart i i, I believe that the heart is 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 not just a, an organ in the body but the voice inside that we say you know the voice of the heart or whatever the, the soul is genuinely real and it's it's part of us but it's also something that is maybe something that is is beyond time and and beyond physical boundaries and something that maybe holds our soul's memory um 
and is able to tell us things about ourselves that we can't see in this physical moment because we're too busy doing millions of other things. But the minute that we can sort of stop and listen to our hearts or listen to our souls, then that's really important. And I encourage my kids to listen to their souls. And I say to them, whatever your soul tells you is right for you, go for it. Okay, really follow, follow that voice. And sometimes it's very scary, right? As adults who know the fear of the world and know the challenges, we we tend to be driven by that fear and, and not follow our heart. But you're right. Every single time we push forward and and enter into that soul level relationship with who we are, we know exactly the right direction. And uh, it, it's played out really well for me as a rabbi at Temple Israel, uh, who, you know, I had no idea that I would end up here in Detroit. For you, you had no idea that you would end up in Israel. And yet, you've made that choice. And it's been a brilliant one for you. And what I also think is interesting is opening up to that soul level relationship between people. You know, I, I joke a lot. You and I were placed together on a teen mission some 20 years ago, and there was an openness to a soul level relationship that we recognized immediately. And I, I think it's important to also see and feel that in not just experiences, but also people and the connections that we make with people, because uh, those those deep connections do exist if we are open to them. I, I, I'm assuming you feel the same way. Uh, absolutely. I, I really, I think it's possibly even a skill that if you can learn to listen to yourself, then you can learn to listen to other people. And I think it's all, I mean, we all know it because you meditate in silence and not in a noisy environment. Uh, when you go to a quiet place, you can hear yourself. Even the rabbis of the Talmud used to talk about the fact that you can never really understand um, God if you're in a marketplace because it's too noisy. And, you know, Moses met God in the middle of the desert when there was no one around. So he, he was able to open, be open to hear in, the, in, a, in a full sense of the word. And I think that once we've learned to listen to ourselves, then we can really listen to other people. Because if we don't listen to ourselves, then we'll never be able to hear the other person in a, in a soul level. And with, when, as you said, with children, it's probably the most important, and with, and with partners as well, that we share our lives with, it's probably the most important thing is to be on that level if, if you can, or at least try to. I mean, with our kids, we know them from the day that they're born, and we can really grow with them which is a beautiful thing. So we can develop with them and we can hear their voices as they grow. And sometimes we meet people later on in life, it's harder to connect, but no, we, <laughs> if we can, it's wonderful. And, but yeah, it's definitely, it's a skill, definitely a skill. And I found that actually one tool, because I'm, I'm looking for ways to teach this skill to people, you, it has to be practiced. And one tool that I've practiced is being able to really look at another person, look into their eyes. I think that there's something about really seeing where somebody's coming from, where, where they are. And as you said, listen, really trying to listen. And that's so hard because uh, it's so much easier to, to vomit out that which is me, but really to keep that silence and to listen to what somebody else is offering to the world. That is, I think, the key to entering into those soul, revel, soul level relationships. It's not always easy, but it is the, a, a, an interesting tool. It is indeed. In so, fact, one of the things that I loved about coming to Israel was that there was a desert here, which is a very quiet place. Because in England, I'd never seen a quiet place before that was as quiet as the desert. There's, there is a... a a kind of suspension in the deserts where everything is just very still. And if you can be in that space, then you can really appreciate a lot of things. It's, it's an amazing, amazing place. And in fact, it's so amazing that when I think of the, the children of Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years, I even wonder why they ever left at all. It was so great. I think that they that, should have just stayed there. <laughs> we should. And, and that's actually part of, I think, my attraction to Israel. Also, the, 
the quietude, not of Tel Aviv and of Jerusalem, but the silence that you can find on a, a simple hike. Uh, you can be alone in a way that I've not been able to be alone in any other place in my life. And I'm, I'm certain that that is in part what drew you to that moment at Shirley's house where you had that deep connection with that natural world that was descending on you on that Friday night. Unfortunately, we are drawing towards the near end of this podcast as well. And there's a, a little piece that I have asked every one of my guests to participate in in these final moments. I'm wondering if there is a book or a television show, something that you have recently engaged in that has helped you sort of shape the way you're thinking now about the world, anything that you're into right now that has uh, led you to new you know, insight or innovations that you could share? Um, well, there's, uh, uh, there is one book that has really, um, I would say, been able to express the things that I've experienced and some of the things that I have been talking about in, in the last few minutes. And I'm sure it's a book that many people have read. It's called The Alchemists by Paulo Coelho. And it is a most incredible book. Um, and I read it and reread it. And every time I'm blown away by how simple and how deep and how just right that book is it's just there are things in that book that I just recall daily um, and it's a wonderful wonderful piece of work so that would be my book <laughs> I love it it's a it's a book that's meaningful to me as well uh, I don't know if you remember but it's a book that you gifted my son at his bar mitzvah we read ah. together uh, Jacob and I explored the story and you're right it is so simple and so correct at every level. Uh, every time I reread it, I literally find myself forgetting where the story will go and then being surprised at the, the beautiful simplicity of the ending. It is perfect, a powerful, perfect end to this podcast. Danny, it's always good to be with you. It is wonderful to have you on the podcast and uh, just um, thank you for being my friend. That's my honor and uh can't wait to see you and uh, just sending the big hug to all of the community and everybody who i have met over the years and all the people who i will meet over the coming years well we are looking forward to seeing you uh shameless plug for an upcoming family mission december of 2022 we can't wait to be together uh, this brings us to the end of another podcast uh, I, I hope that today you learned just a little bit about yourself i hope you've learned as you've listened today to my friend Danny Margolis from Ramat HaShofet in Israel, a little bit about how we can access our soul. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on future podcasts. And until then, continue to wake up to life every day. L'chaim. Thank you, Rabbi Joseph. L'chaim.